Hey everybody, it's Steve with Real Progressives. Um, we look back in our nation's history uh, going way, way back. And you can see the influence Christianity has had on our nation, um, both good and bad. And when you look at the Catholic Church and the way the Catholic Church treated its uh, parishioners, the Catholic Church was under the assumption that regular people couldn't possibly understand the Bible. So they forbid the regular people from reading the Bible. And they basically made up rules and they made up regulations and they made up uh, man-made laws uh, to corroborate with what they saw as the Word of God. But they would create these new laws within the church, church discipline and so forth, that kept people in line. They kept them, you know, right where they wanted them. And, you know, when we look at the... Calvinistic mindset, the the work ethic, uh, you know, the 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 idea that um, you know you do good, you work hard, good things happen to you, um, has been instilled into most of us our entire lives. Um, it's as much a part of being an American, if you will, as any other possible um, mindset, you know, has ever been attributed to America. Um, and so you've got an entire sect of our population who believes that Calvinism, believes the work ethic, believes that um, it is the be-all, end-all to success in, in this country. And a lot of that stemmed from false teachings. Um, you know, whether this is not a discussion about the goodness or badness of the Bible or Christianity. This is simply the description of the control mechanism that the leaders of the church used on their parishioners. So as you, you look at the way people's minds are structured, the way they view the world, and the way they process information, what you got is a situation where people take that lens and then they transfer it to every other area, every other area. Um, when I talk about um, economics, it's primarily because I was lied to and I paid good money to be lied to, you know? Um, you know, we were taught that, you know, government funded itself through selling bonds. And that's why back in the day, back in the early war period, you know, you had people running around the country selling war bonds, right? The idea, though, is very simple, and it's a control thing. And this is what I really want to drive home. I was in a debate with somebody who you all know and love, um, but for right now, until he and I are done, I'll keep him, um, you know, quiet. I'll keep him anonymous. But one of the concerns that you've got to start wondering is, is that, you know, back in the day when we weren't really up for war, nobody wanted to go to war. Nobody wanted to go to World War II. Nobody wanted to really be a part of that. So you've got some conspiracies that, uh, you know, Franklin Delano Roosevelt decided that he was going to let Japan bomb Pearl Harbor, that he knew it was coming, and that he knew it was the only way to get people on board. The other side to that coin is that by getting people to spend money on war bonds to pay for the war effort, now mind you, even though we were pegged to gold, etc., you know, we were able to print as much money as we wanted. That was the devaluing of the currency that you hear so much about today. Um, we could have done whatever we wanted. But instead, they decided to sell war bonds. Okay, and it was a means of getting you to buy in, literally. Literally, figuratively, buy into the war effort. Then, with Social Security. Think about this for a minute. Social Security is paid for the same way every other program is paid for, with sovereign currency. Your Social Security payments, they don't fund Social Security. That's not how it works. But again, they give you the appearance that you're buying into it. By keeping that Calvinistic thinking in your head that this is something that you've paid into your whole life and there's a certain amount of money in there that you've paid your whole life and you're entitled to the certain amount of money because 
that's all part of the grab you. That's all part of you feeling like you got skin in the game. Another Calvinistic approach. You know, this all harkens back to that Judeo-Christian values. And now, again, this is not talking badly about the church. I'm, it, I, I want to make sure we're all on the same page here. If you get that impression, that's not what I'm trying to say. I'm just merely showing you the control mechanisms that they use. So now today, people are talking about Social Security is insolvent. Oh my God, we've got to do something crazy to save Social Security. No, you don't. We know that, okay? But what they're trying to do is they have a philosophical belief in free markets. They have a philosophical belief in privatization. They have a philosophical approach to all these things. They're not true in terms of you got to do these things. It's the only way that they can make you buy into the need to shift. So by telling you it's broke, by telling you that it's strapped and that we've got to raise FICA taxes in order to pay for it and all this stuff, that's the control factor yet again. They're trying to maintain a ownership, a skin in the game mindset that makes it so that you won't touch these things, that you'll, you, you feel vested into it. The ACA was supposed to be like that. The only difference is, is that, yet again, it was just another insurance company grab. The reality, though, is, is that you, not you necessarily, I get in trouble with that. Some people don't understand a figurative you, but whoever the people are that I'm speaking to, believe that the ACA has solved our health care problem because they've sold it as such. Again, another control mechanism. Shut up and eat your peas, okay? This right here, this constant belief that we've got to have a trade-off, we've got to do this. You know, this person that I'm discussing with really believes in soaking the rich, raising taxes on the rich. And I'm not opposed to that. If you want to raise taxes on the rich, knock yourself out. But just do so knowing that you're not paying for anything, okay? Do it so that you understand that that's not actually funding any programs. If you want to do that because you're trying to solve for income inequality, knock yourself out, okay? If you're doing it to diminish their ability to buy government, you got to do a hell of a lot more than a 2% tax, okay? So let's just keep it real yo as to what the motivation is, okay? If you sit there and decide that you want to tax them and you hold Medicare for all hostage while you fight the tax battle, we've got a problem. We've got a problem because you're putting people's lives, you're putting their health at risk while you fight your pet tax battle. Your pet tax battle is irrelevant to needing single-payer health care, right? Think about it. If it doesn't fund spending, why are you tying the two together? But this is all part of that whole Calvinistic skin in the game. We got to put some money towards this service or it's not going to be real. They won't take it for serious. They won't, they won't realize that, you know, it's, they're paying for it. They're paying into it. That skin in the game, Calvinism, is GOP logic. And so when you see people saying it, you should have his bells going off in your head that Luther had when he realized the church was selling penances. You should be like, whoa, dude, if you want to raise taxes, raise them. Go ahead and fight that fight. But don't hold up health care for me and my family because you don't understand that taxes don't fund spending. Go ahead and fight that battle over there. But just know what you're fighting for. Your tax dollars aren't funding squat. You want to do that? Let that fight be elsewhere. Don't hijack my education or my health care or green energy because you have a need to soak the rich. Two separate things all together. One does not fund the other. So if you want to have an ideological battle like the church did on its own people, if you want to be a tax 
you know, obsessor, a fetishizer, make that a separate issue. And so our government has kept us, though, in this state of mind where they try to keep you feeling like they can't afford things because it keeps you hungry and it keeps you tepid and it keeps you fearful and it keeps you living very small. It keeps you from seeing a world beyond your own nose because you're so worried paycheck to paycheck what life is going to bring. And they do that on purpose in some sort of an invisible handshake with our private sector businesses to keep you willing to work for pennies on the dollar, you know, compared to what it should be and could be. So the fight for 15 sounds really good. And in lieu of a federal job guarantee, it is better, right? But I don't want to fight for 15. I want to fight for a federal job guarantee. Why? Because a federal job guarantee sets the benchmark for benefits, for pay, for working hours, for working conditions, for time off, for family life balance, you name it. And it compensates work, such as maybe you're an activist. An activist could be considered work. So instead of having to trade off whether you want to be a part of democracy or whether you want to go push paper from one side of your desk to the other, the job guarantee would give you that, right? But instead, they'll keep you believing that we've got to fight, I mean, fight to up that minimum wage a couple dollars. There's no benefits tied to that. There's no citizen benefits tied to that at all. So that is an incremental change that is better than nothing, but it is definitely not really solving for income inequality. The private sector would have to match whatever the federal job guarantee said in order to poach people out of the federal job guarantee. So I can't hire you unless I'm willing to pay what they pay, and it includes benefits. So think about that when you start assessing you know, the merits of different plans. Now listen, here's something else too. Someone said I'm really, really harsh with the end the Fed people. <laughs> I am. And I'll tell you why. Because for whatever fetishizing they have about ending the Federal Reserve and somebody will say, but it's privately and I'm like, it's not, but go ahead and tell me more about it. And they can't do it. It's the ignorance that bothers me. It's not the just to end the Fed because there's a lot of ignorant people. But when they start talking and they keep going with it and going with it and demanding there's no single payer health care, there's no fixes for climate change, there's no free college for all, there's no family medical leave, there is none of the things that we want until we end the Fed because it's debt. That's when I get angry. Now, if you don't understand that, I'm sorry, but I put people's lives lives ahead of your fetish about the Federal Reserve. I put their life ahead of your fetish. I just do. It's it's more important to me that people have health care, not just health insurance, but health care. It's more important to me that we have mental health care so people aren't shooting each other than you get your precious fetish of end the Fed. So that's what the problem is. It's not a matter of whether or not I agree we should mend the Fed. It's not an issue of whether I think we should change the rules or whether we should make the Fed do different things. You're confusing it. I'm saying our first battle must be to get people health care. And if you place the Fed above that, it tells me you don't really understand economics. And it tells me you don't have the right priorities. That's what it tells me. If you're willing to let people suffer while you go after your fetish, I don't really have the same values that you do. We don't share the same values, if that's what you think is the most important thing. So, if you want to change something, if you know what you're talking about with the Fed, and you have some real honest-to-God belief, and not something from Ron Paul, let's talk about it. But it should not be placed ahead of people's health. Again, another lie built to keep the masses down and to expand the wealth gap yet again. So there's a whole bunch of little things. Here's the high-end macro, 
Then there's this kind of like mid-range macro micro thinking that's more policy driven. The policies that we come up with to offset the truths at the top, we can debate that all day long. We can come up with different ways of doing it. I'm not in dispute. If you want to come up with greenbacks, you want to come up with this, you want to do that, whatever. I'm not going to sit there and sweat that. I'm just trying to disabuse you all of the Catholic teaching of debt and deficits and all the nonsense that keeps us fighting with each other and divided constantly, fighting these tax battles that are irrelevant. Fighting about end the Fed when you don't even know what they do. When you don't even understand what they do, but you can say the bumper sticker slogan, I don't have a lot of respect for that. I'm sorry, I don't. It's the issue, once again, is sidetracking people's lives. Their families suffer while you fetishize and the Fed. While you fetishize Rothschilds. While you fetishize that and fetishize debt and talk about debt. Debt to whom? We're monetarily sovereign, folks. We pay interest. It's sovereign money being spent on the interest. It's not your tax dollars. It's the way we expand the economy. Is it the best way to expand the economy? Probably not the best way to do it. There's probably other ways that you could do it. But there are no other ways you can do it immediately to solve for income inequality when it comes to a federal job guarantee, when it comes to full employment, when it comes to the uh, Medicare for all. And they're telling you the friggin' wretches that follow monetarist thinking, that believe that, you know, all these games with, uh, you know, interest rates and shit that they do over there within the Federal Reserve, the people that are steeped and talking to us all about, um, you know, debt and deficits, trying to get us, um, trying to get us to cut spending. Those individuals are the ones I'm referring to. Okay, we don't cut spending, not when we are a net importer. You cannot do that. You've got to fill the bathtub back up somehow or another. And right now, whether you like it or not, Congress is the fiscal owner. The monetary policy owner, which is to solve these problems with monetary policy, is like pushing a string up a hill. Okay? But the Fed has monetary policy. So these are the fallacies that we're taught that are like religion to the Mises crew, to the Austrians, etc., this religion is lethal to regular people. And while I would love to have you partner with me as an Austrian, as a Paul guy, whatever, I know that you won't because you're steeped in gold bug logic. And so therefore, I end up having to call you out because you're putting your fetish ahead of people's lives. And that right there, my friends, is untenable. So with that, I hope you kind of see the game they play. They make you feel like you're buying into something. That's why they say, how are you going to pay for it? And in the end, it's really a joke. It really is just about a psychological game to make you feel like you've bought into it. And that's it. Anyway, this is Steve with Real Progressives. I hope you have a great day.